One of the things I love about our church is every time we get together, we have this really unique mix of people. And if you're newer, you may not be aware of this, but we have a, a mix of people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God. We have a mix of people who have followed God for a long time, followed God for a short time, used to follow God, but gave up over time following God. Uh, we have people who have been in church a long time and people who left church because they had really bad experiences, which is a terrible thing to have to go through, but they had bad experiences, so they left. You know, They're just now coming back trying to see if they can give it another chance. We got this unique mix of people here, which I think is amazing because it helps us to, to realize all of us have a lot in common. All of us go through life and deal with a lot of similar things in life. And what we're going to talk about today is one of those. I want to start by asking you this question. Have you ever held on to something you knew was harming you? Now, let me answer that for you. Yes, you have. So have I. This is just human behavior. It's kind of odd, but we all do this. We all hold on to things that end up harming us. Maybe for you, it was a dating relationship. You knew it wasn't healthy. You wouldn't give it up. You just held on to it anyway. Um, maybe it was a job, and you knew that job was requiring you to prioritize your job above your family, and it was hurting your family, and it was hurting your relationship with them, but you just wouldn't let it go. Um, maybe it was a habit. It was a spending habit. It was an eating habit. It was a, a smoking habit. It was, you know, whatever. And you may have even had a doctor look at you and say, you know, you've got to change this, or it's going to kill you. And what did you do? You said, thanks, doc, but it's my life, and I'll do what I want. That's what you did. It makes no sense, right? If it was somebody else, you'd be like, stop it. But it was you, and you're like, yeah, telling me what to do, you know? I'm going to hold on to this even though I know it's hurting me. It may have been an addiction for some of you. It was a porn addiction. It was an alcohol addiction. It was a drug addiction, whatever it was. All of us have done this, which does raise the question, why would reasonably intelligent individuals, because that's you, right? Why would reasonably intelligent individuals hold on to something and refuse to give up something that they knew was hurting them? Why would we hold on to something we knew wasn't in our best interest? And what does it cost us when we do that? I want to circle back to that idea in just a minute. But to catch you all up, this is week two of our series we're calling White Flag. The whole premise of this series is simply this. All of us have had moments, and some of us are in a moment right now, where we are running from God. And by running from God, here's all I mean. We either knew God wanted us to do something that we refused to do, or we knew, we, were, we knew he didn't want us to do something we were doing, and we refused to stop doing it. And whenever you intentionally make a choice to do that again and again and again, that qualifies as running from God. You're just being too stubborn. You're being too rebellious. I'm being too stubborn and rebellious. We just don't want to quit what we're doing. And you may immediately think when you think running from God, uh, people who've got wild stories and just kind of doing some crazy stuff, and that's in some of your stories, and I get that. That's fine, but that's, that's not all I'm talking about. Like, they're defiant runners. We all know what that looks like. It's very public. But there are also a lot of quiet runners. A lot of us are quiet runners. Quiet runners are people who want to uh, portray a certain image. We want to look good, and we want everybody to feel like, you know, we're on the right track. So we go through all the motions. Quiet runners show up at church. Quiet runners do all that kind of stuff. But deep down inside, we know there's something we're ignoring God on. There's something that we should do we're not. There's something that we're not doing that we should, whatever that looks like for you. And we're just too rebellious. We're just too stubborn to surrender. So why is it? Why is it that we would hold on to something we know is hurting us and harming us? Instead of surrendering to the God who we know has what's best in mind for us. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But we've all done it. And a lot of us are probably doing it right now. And if you don't think that's you, just think, was well, there anything in my life that I know God's been clear I should do that I'm not? And the reality for most of us is the answer is yes, which by definition makes us a runner. So what we're doing over the course of three weeks is we're learning some lessons about what happens when we run from one of history's most famous runners. And if you've, you know, been in or around church, quite honestly, just growing up in the South. You've heard this guy's name at some point. His name is Jonah. And to give you a little context, what makes Jonah's story so unique is Jonah was a Jewish prophet who lived in the 8th century B.C. And typically prophets would get a message from God that they were supposed to go and deliver to a group of people who were running from God. But Jonah got a message from God. He was not interested in delivering, so he decided to run himself. He became a runner. And in the course of this, there are some interesting lessons that he learned. And the reason I think it's so important for us to spend a little time with it is because there's a little bit of Jonah's story in ours. There's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. So let me catch you up real quick if you weren't here last week. 
Now, Jonah grew up and lived in a town in the nation of Israel by the name of Gath Hefer. It was located right about here. And God shows up to Jonah one day and says, Jonah, I've got a message I want you to deliver to a group of people. And typically, that would be Jonah's own Jewish people. That's how that usually worked. But this time, God said, no, no, no. I don't want you to deliver a message to your people. I want you to go up to the Assyrians. The Assyrian Empire is the most powerful empire at the time in the 8th century B.C. He said, I want you to go up to them. I want you to go to their capital city of Nineveh, which is where modern-day Mosul, Iraq is located. He said, I want you to tell these Assyrians that if they don't keep, if they don't let go of their ways, if they don't change their ways, that consequences are coming. Judgment is coming. They're, they're going to end up suffering if they don't start living and behaving differently. Now, what made this complicated was the Assyrians considered the Jewish people to be their enemies and vice versa. And so Jonah hears this and he's like, there's no way I'm going to go and warn our enemies. One, they're going to kill me. Two, I don't actually want them to be warned. I want God to do whatever he's going to do to them. I don't want them to succeed or to do well in any way. And so Jonah comes up with this plan. Seems brilliant. He goes down to this little port city right here by the name of Joppa. He jumps on a trade ship that ran through the Mediterranean Sea, you know, just trade routes over and over and over again. And this ship, he finds out, is going all the way to Spain, to the city of Tarshish over here. And he's like, this is perfect. I'm going to get on a ship and go as far away from Nineveh as I possibly can, and there's no way God will ever get me to Nineveh. Take that, God. It's, you know, he's just being full-on rebellious. If you know anything about the story, you know that it starts. He gets on the ship, and they're sailing through the Mediterranean, and then out of the blue, a storm hits, a storm that is so severe that these hardened, experienced sailors are like, we're going to die. It scares them to death. And to make a long story short, they start trying to figure out what's caused the storm because they're you know, they, they're superstitious and believing, well, somebody's upset a God here or there. And, and Jonah finally admits, I think it's me. You know, I, I'm the one who's upset my God. Um, I'm actually running from him right now. To which these sailors are like, okay, well, this is on you. What do we have to do to make your God happy so we don't die in this storm? Which, that's the point in the story you would expect Jonah to say, let's just find the next island. Y'all drop me off. I'll head to Nineveh. Everybody will be good. But you know when you're running, sometimes you can have an unusual amount of stubbornness, can't you? And Jonah did. Jonah looks at him. Imagine being, doing this. Jonah looks at him and says, well, there's only, there's only one thing that's going to stop this storm. Y'all just toss me overboard and let me drown. To which I would be like, can we start with something less severe, you know? Let's try some other stuff. Jonah's like, no, no, no. I'm not going to Nineveh, and I know God's trying to get me there. I'd rather die than end up in Nineveh, so... Sailors eventually are like, we got no choice. They throw him overboard. This is where we left off the story last time. Jonah, the storm stops, but Jonah is in the middle of these waves, in the middle of the sea, and he's sinking and drowning. But he's, he's doing it happy. He's doing it at least, at least convinced that he's held on to his autonomy and God is not forcing him to do what he doesn't want to do. That is how rebellious Jonah is. And it's at that point in the story that the writer tells us, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. You got to know Jonah sinking in the depths of the Mediterranean going, okay, this is the end, but I, I did it my way. And then here comes this fish. And he had to have thought, God, that's just cruel. Let me drown, but I don't want to be eaten by a fish. Just let me drown. But what Jonah didn't realize was this was not punishment the way it looked. Now, real quick, and we'll move on. I said this last week, but for those of you who weren't here last week, if this part of the story really trips you up and you're like, Matt, there's, I'm checking out because there's no way I'm going to believe that a guy lived in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, I get it. We can talk about that another time. It doesn't matter. Here's, I'm just going to give you an out because... Here's all I want you to think about. You read fictional stories all the time and get inspired by them. You watch made-up movies all the time and you learn something from them. So you can learn from things that aren't true. So if you don't think this is true, just move it to the side. Don't miss the moral of the story because you get tripped up over this. Now, I believe this happened because Jesus said it happened. But we can discuss that a whole nother time. The point is Jonah's about to learn a lesson that may be important for all of us to learn. The writer goes on to say, from inside the fish, 
Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And the writer records for us Jonah's prayer. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Just real quick. This is an ironic, interesting thing about human nature. Have you ever noticed it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. If things get bad enough, if life's difficult enough, if things are painful enough, all of us eventually have a tendency to look up and ask for help, don't we? I mean, even if you don't believe in God, I, I've got friends who don't believe in God who have gotten to points in their life where it was a prayer kind of like to whom it may concern. You know, I don't know who's up there, but if there's anybody up there to help, I'm ready for some help. Life can do that to us, can it? This is where Jonah was. Now, it's ironic it took Jonah. He didn't mind drowning. He wasn't going to pray when he was drowning. He was sticking it to God, you know. But once he ends up in the belly of a fish, okay, well, that guy's attention. And what Jonah discovers as he begins to pray, he discovers something I think surprised him and may surprise some of us. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. And the surprising thing is he answered me. In spite of all my rebellion, in spite of the way I treated him, in spite of how stubborn I'd been, the minute I called out, he answered. From the depths of the grave, which is Jonah's way of saying, when life was as bad as it could be and I'd hit rock bottom, I finally then called for help. And lo and behold, you, God, listen to my cry. Listen, God always listens to the desperate cries of desperate people who were living in the middle of desperate circumstances they created for themselves. It does not matter how rebellious you've been and how many times you have turned your back on God. When life gets to the point where you realize you need help, God's always there ready to listen. He's always ready to help. And Jonah realized that in this moment. And then Jonah, it's kind of funny, but Jonah begins to describe for God what his experience was like sinking in the Mediterranean, as if God didn't know. But Jonah wants to recount and is like, hey, God, I just want you to know what I went through to get to this point. So here's what he says next. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. The engulfing of waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed, he's getting really graphic. Seaweed was around my head. This does not sound like a fun experience, does it? He goes on, and he, the writer says, To the roots of the mountains, Jonah prays, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. He's describing what it was like knowing he was about to drown. But then, he says, You brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Which was his way of describing, When I thought it was over, you sent a fish to save me. I saw that fish coming, and I thought he was there to punish me. I now realize, God, you weren't sending punishment for me. You were saving me. You were saving my life. That fish was to help me. He says, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. And then, what Jonah prays next is the breakthrough moment. It's the breakthrough insight. It's the thing that if you don't get anything else today, I hope you don't forget this. This is what caused Jonah to change his ways. He prays, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And I want to pause right here. because This is so important. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be yours could be mine all of us tend to think well I don't have any idols but let me explain to you what an idol is an idol is anything that you have made the top priority of your life when it doesn't deserve it an idol is anything that you have put at the center of your life when it was not designed to carry the weight of it and it is often good things it may be money it may be attention, affection, power, control. It may be a relationship. It may be family. All good things. But what you discover over time is, as good as money is, it was never designed to be the top priority for your life. As 
as important as family is, they were not designed to be at the center of your life and carry the weight of your life. Which is why Jonah describes them as worthless idols. And you know how you know they're worthless? It's not that they're bad, they're just in the wrong place in your life. You know, you know how you know they're worthless? Well, there are two ways. The first one's super obvious. Because in your darkest moments and your worst times in life, you have never once cried out to them for help, have you? That's how you know they're worthless. Have you ever had a moment that was so bad in your life that you cried out and said, Oh, stack of Benjamins, please help me? You have not. Have you ever got to a moment in your life and you prayed, Oh, kids, please come and say, No, because you know that's not going to happen. I mean, they're, they're good things. But in that moment, you know, they're not supposed to be at the center of my life. I'm not looking to them for help. I'm, I'm looking up. Because they're worthless to do anything in this moment. You know God's the only one who can help. But the other reason they're worthless as a top priority or they're worthless in being in the center of your life is because whatever you give highest priority to in your life, that's what you worship. And this is important. What you choose to worship defines you. What you choose to worship shapes your identity. What you choose to worship is where you're looking for your security in life. And if you have chosen to make the top priority, the center of your life, anything that is uncertain, anything that you can lose, then it's worthless as an object of worship to you. It's not worthless in and of itself. It's worthless as your top priority. Because if I build my life on my family, or on money, or on power, or whatever your thing is. You know what happens, because some of you are living it. You're in constant fear and anxiety because you know at any moment you might lose that thing that's at the center of your life. It's why some of you live with so much anxiety. It's not the only reason for anxiety, but it's a reason. Because when you're trying to build your life on something that you know can be taken away or lost at any point, you're in a constant state of fear and anxiety. You're always trying to protect that thing. You're always afraid of what's going to happen if you lose it. You can never live with peace and security. Which is why your heavenly father invites you to put him at the center because he's the only one designed to carry that weight and to carry it well for you. He's the only one that if you put at the center, you never have to wonder, am I going to lose him? Which means you can live with the security and peace we all search for. So everything else, it's good stuff, should be a part of your life in a lot of cases. But wasn't designed to be at the center. It doesn't deserve to be top priority. Which is why Job says, I realize now, sitting in the belly of this fish, that the whole reason I was running from God is because I was clinging to, I was holding on to things that were actually worthless idols. I was holding on to something that was harming me but I wouldn't let it go. And you know what it cost me? Job says, I forfeited the grace that could have been mine. When you hold on to things that are harming you and you refuse to let them go, you forfeit the grace that could be yours. That doesn't mean God removes his grace from you. That doesn't mean God's not going to offer it to you. It means you're refusing to accept it. That you're choosing to hold on to something that's going to hurt you and it's costing you the relationship you actually need and want the most. Because you know what it takes to let go? It takes humility. Grace is the unearned, undeserved, unexpected love and favor and goodness and acceptance of God. And what's ironic about grace is it's freely offered to you and it's freely offered to me. There's only one thing that locks the door and keeps us from experiencing grace, and it's pride. Because by definition, grace is unearned and undeserved. And the minute we think we've earned it or deserve it, we can no longer have it. But when we're humble enough to admit we don't deserve it, we have complete access to it. And Jonah's point, what he's realizing in this moment is, I have held on to something in my pride that has kept me from being able to get the very thing I actually needed most. My lack of humility has limited God's grace in my life. And for some of us, our lack of humility 
has closed the door on our ability to experience God's grace in ours. He's standing there offering. We've just shut the door on our ability to accept it. So Jonah, in this moment, he realizes for him, he's been holding on to two worthless idols. His autonomy, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to let God interfere with my plans. And he's been holding on to his national patriotism. Oh, God, I'll do what you want me to do as long as it helps my people. But if it's going to help our enemies, I'm not about to be involved in that. And those two idols have cost him. Those two idols are why he is where he is at this moment. So what do you do? When you've been running from God and holding on to things, clinging to worthless idols, and forfeiting the grace that could be yours. I'll show you what Jonah did. Sitting in the belly of a fish, here's what Jonah prays. He goes on and he says, But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I'll make good, because salvation comes from the Lord. This is just Jonah's way of saying, I surrender. That's it. This is Jonah's way of expressing humility. This is Jonah's way of saying, I'm tired of trying to do it my way. I'm going to stop clinging to worthless idols, and instead I'm going to humbly admit I need something I don't deserve, God, and I'm going to ask you to give it to me. This is what surrender looks like. And what's so interesting in this story is the moment Jonah chooses to surrender, God's grace is right there. The writer tells us, as soon as Jonah surrenders, here's what happens. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because you don't want to visualize this very long, okay? However, I don't want you to miss this. Jonah's choices had put him in the belly of a fish. And when he surrendered, God offered him grace. But that grace did not erase the consequences. God didn't say, I love seeing your humility. I'm just going to snap my fingers and you're going to be on dry land. God said, I love seeing your humility. You've got my grace. But man, you've made a mess with what you've done. And now we're going to have to walk out of those consequences. Well, how do I get out of the belly of a fish? You don't really want to know. Close your eyes and hold your nose. It's kind of what happened. Some of you can relate to this, right? Because your consequences have taken you to a place you didn't want to be, your choices. And God's with you. And the minute you surrender, the minute you quit running, the minute you turn around and say, okay, I need you. He's going he's gonna to give you his grace. And he's going to walk you out of that mess and out of those consequences. But it will not be immediate. But he'll be with you through it. That's what he did for Jonah. And then, this is maybe the most encouraging part. And then the writer tells us that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. He said, Jonah, you get a second chance. And for some of you, you feel like you've run so far and you've messed up so bad and you've done so much that you're out of chances. And I just want you to know, if Jonah wasn't out of chances, neither are you. God is a God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. 10th, 100th chances. When you choose to respond in humility, his grace is always there. You can't outrun him. And you can't lock that door on his grace. And as you might expect, Jonah had learned his lesson. And the writer tells us Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. To which you expect it to be, okay, end of story. Everything's great and they all lived happily ever after. That is not what happened. As a matter of fact, for all of you church people, you have always been taught that this is the whole point of Jonah's story. It's actually not the whole point. It's not even the main point. What happens when Jonah gets to Nineveh next week, that's the main point of the story. But before we get there, I just want to ask you, are you holding on to something that's harming you? And you know it is. And people have told you it is. And others have warned you. And people who care about you have tried to talk you out of it. But you won't let go of it. 
Are you ready to lay down your pride, to choose humility, and to let go? Because the thing you're holding on to is actually keeping you from the relationship you want most. You're locking the door to your ability to experience God's grace, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. But the minute you choose to respond in humility, he's right there waiting. So as we close, I want to give you an opportunity. And I want to give me an opportunity to do what Jonah did and to surrender, to surrender. And surrender sounds like such a terrible thing, but it's not. Freedom is always on the other side of surrender. Because you are not surrendering to an enemy. You are surrendering to your Savior and your loving Heavenly Father. You're surrendering to a God who loves you so much that he has done exactly what any loving parent would do when they see a child running in a direction that's going to harm them. He's tried to get your attention. He's run after you. Not to pay you back, he's run after you to win you back. In some cases, he has allowed chaos and consequences and pain of your, from your decisions to catch up to you. But not because he's mad at you. Because like any parent, he's willing to do whatever needs to happen to keep you from hurting yourself more. So you ready to stop running? The beauty of it is when you decide to stop running and turn around, you don't have to look for God and try to find him. He's right there because he's never left you. He's been running after you the whole time, hoping you would come back to him. You may give up on God. But God never gives up on you. You may give up on God, and when you do, you miss out on his grace. But the minute you turn around, grace is there waiting for you. He's there waiting for you. The only limit to God's grace is your lack of humility. It's my lack of humility. Nothing else. So when you surrender, you find the grace that you've needed all along. So as we close, if that's you and you're like, I need to let go. I've been clinging to worthless idols. I need to let go. I've been running and been stubborn, rebellious, and proud. I want to give you a chance to do what Jonah did and to surrender. Let's pray together. God, for all of us who need to surrender, for all of us who are holding on to something that's harming us, and we know it. Other people have told us. Internally, we've known it. We've just been too proud to stop it. In this moment, we choose to surrender. Just to let it go as best we can. And instead, to hold on to you. We don't want to continue to forfeit the opportunity to experience your grace and your peace and your love and your forgiveness and your presence with us. So help us moving forward to keep you at the center of our lives. And when we mess it up, and when we falter, and when we go back and start holding on again, remind us. Help us to get back on track. To stop running away from you. To start running towards you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.